Hi, I'm Martha Beck. And I'm Rowan Mangan. And this is another episode of Bewildered, the podcast for people trying to figure it out, isn't Mm -hmm. it, Marty? Yes. And so what are you trying to figure out at this moment in your life? (sighs) Do you ever, like, think, is everyone as weird as me? And Constantly. they They just don't talk about it? Constantly. You know where you do that thing where you're just like, this is what my life is like and I'm familiar with how odd it is, but I don't really see that oddness represented around me. What oddness do you speak of in specifics? All right, so what I'm thinking what I'm thinking of is something that happened last week where uh, I was in New York with Lila at our apartment and our babysitter came over, lovely young woman, and I, in that morning I had, been a little bit sleepy Lila hasn't slept well and so I was I was sort of a little bit taken aback when she turned up because I might have just dozed off a little bit when the babysitter turned up the babysitter okay sorry and Lila is a baby Lila just in case this is their first listen I'm sorry Lila is a baby (laughs) some (laughs) random baby uh babysitter turns up I'm a little bit sleepy and taken aback and oh gosh is it that time already I'm in my pjs Right, I'm in my Shocking. PJs. I'm not ashamed of that. That's, That's not okay. odd. That's okay, isn't it? Yeah, totally. So I'm quickly because at like ten to nine, I was like, "Oh crap, she's going to be here." So I'm quickly making oatmeal for Lila. Uh, here's the oatmeal. Babysitter comes in. She's talking to me. I'm in the kitchen. She's near the kitchen. And you punched me. her in the face. I did nothing of the sort. Oh, honey. you're not odd. Go on. All right. So what happened was Lila is in a bit of a clingy phase and really needed my full attention and like Mm. my the attention not just of my face but also my hands in that moment Ah. but my hands as I spoke to the babysitter this is the multitasking reality of the mother talk to the babysitter deal with the toddler underfoot juggle my cup of coffee very important part of the morning her oatmeal right so a bowl of oatmeal in one hand coffee in the other hand right can you picture it I've got it I'm painting the word picture for you I'm walking, I'm trying to walk towards the babysitter to get Uh this show on the uh road while we chat. Now, what happened at that moment, Marty? Yes. Is that Lila grabbed my pajama pants as I tried to walk forward. I see. And and her (laughs) clinginess just she she just transferred it all away from me myself and just into those PJ pants. pants. These pink flannel big gold PJ pants. And (laughs) so all right so maybe this is the bit that maybe I'm weird I don't like to wear underwear to bed oh my god (laughs) (laughs) I don't it's not comfortable so when my pants were pulled down oh dear in front of a babysitter that we don't know super well yet um well enough to trust her with our kid but not well enough to like get get naked naked, (laughs) I would think so yeah uh, that happened we didn't mention it no you never will no, um, I don't know. I don't feel like we're closer necessarily <laughs> from that. I would have expected maybe that there'd be or maybe she would have gone out of her way to find an opportunity to, mm. like, do the same thing so that I felt better about You'd it. you think she would just drop trow right there. <laughs> we're all good. This is great. No problem. <laughs> I think this so. actually may become a barrier to intimacy, ironically. <laughs> Getting naked at first notice, you know, first friendship is like, yeah, that you're never going to get over that. In fairness, I was only half naked, but it's just not the regular half that you expect. Yeah, when you would sort of want naked. the other half if you had to choose. If you had to choose, and so would probably the babysitter choose the other half. It's interesting because I wonder if that's cultural. Which half is more private? Is that cultural well, or is Japan, that nature? They have bars, or they did when I was there a hundred years ago, called no pawn bars. So the like we have Hooters in America where the waitresses have I know I do (laughs) yeah (laughs) I speak for yourself um but they have in in Japan they have these no pond bars where the women have blouses on but nothing from the waist down Uh so I think that that is like more the focus there I'm not sure but I so yeah I mean it's maybe if something's more sexually desirable I don't know. They just I, maybe they just think that part is less embarrassing for some reason. Mm, I don't know. Maybe the whole thing is that that it's half. 
you know, like it doesn't matter as much which half as that half is concealed, half is revealed. Yeah, you just I just picture you sailing out of the kitchen like Venus in the Botticelli, <laughs> just naked. In a clamshell. In a clamshell. What babysitter wouldn't be pleased to work for such a family? <laughs> Branching a cup of coffee in a <laughs> bowl oatmeal. of oatmeal. The divine oatmeal. <laughs> What you should have done is just handed both of them to the babysitter and said, for you, madame, and then done a little dance. <laughs> so you would, no, I meant, I meant for this to happen. <laughs> That's what I tried to convey. Like I tried to convey like, oh, this again. Like, and I kind of put, I quickly put the coffee and the oatmeal down on the counter and, um, and grabbed my pants, but like all the time keeping this facial expression of, of like, <laughs> oh, kids. <laughs> This is, anyway, so that's look. Wake up, Australia. Wake up. You should have Australia. said, Wake up, Australia, because that would make her think that in Australia you get up, you have your coffee, you have your oatmeal, you drop your pants, and that's the morning. I just thank you for saying that because I just really want my Aussie listeners to appreciate that whenever um, someone is in front of me and I'm driving and the red light has changed to green and they haven't moved yet, I like to say, Wake up, Australia. Yeah, and I've brought. I'm bringing that to America, and it's cruel because Australia is asleep at that moment. Oh my God, you're so right. Yeah, it's cruel. Marty, save me from myself. What are you trying to figure uh, out? Everything, everything swirls around this two and a half year old who <laughs> yeah, is just laying is. waste to our lives. I've talked before about Lila's brutal strength. <laughs> That's like true. the child is uncannily powerful, right? <laughs> Always has been, and now she's. I'm not only seeing the strength, I'm seeing how she filters it through her two and a half year old filter of, you would filter things through a filter of perception and how she experiences what we do for her. Mm. Because yesterday I was sitting, we'd gone into the bathroom. This is a big, <laughs> exciting adventure. When she was born, I decided she could not come in my bathroom and that except that then I would allow it on certain occasions and it would become special and ritualized. I just need to say she doesn't mean like in the toilet. No, 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 no. I <laughs> just like, you know, there's a the vanity with bathroom. drawers and, you know, makeup and and brushes and things. So, she found some necklaces that were tangled. So, I was sitting on the bathroom floor untangling the necklaces, tender moment with my child. You know, I'm down at her level. And all of a sudden, I just <laughs> the untangling necklaces. You just say it as though, you know, you weaving do. baskets. Yeah. And suddenly I, I get a vicious blow to the head. Bam! Sorry, our, our producer's Sorry, not going to be happy with that. I wasn't happy. It was a solid thunk. And I look up and there's Lila with a hairbrush. And she says, okay, Muffy, time to do your hair. Wham! And it hits me again. Bam! Bam! And I start to just savagely beaten about the head and face. And she's like, don't hold still, Muffy. I just need to do your hair. Wham, wham, wham. And then she goes, we're just going to get it out of your eyes. Bam. <laughs> my hair is not long enough to go in my eyes. But this is what she's been subjected to. It's kind of a reenactment of a trauma. So then by the time she's done, my hair is sticking out in a billion directions and I have black eyes and she's like, yeah, isn't that better? <laughs> <laughs> what I love about it is, oh, there's so many things I love about this story. One, raised by lesbians, like clearly uh, we're trying to convey to her at all times, I'm not trying to make your hair look good. I'm just trying to get it out of your eyes. Just For God's sake, don't judge me on the quality of the ponytail that right. I am now constructing. Like that's for sure. But then I also love that there's like a real psychopathic kind of vibe there where she's like yes. hitting you and going, don't worry, Muffy. I'm just getting it out of your eyes. And, <laughs> and I think that's how she, this is probably how she experiences the world. She's this tiny person and we come at her with objects and like randomly Ooh. strike her in the head and say, we're getting it out of your eyes. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. funny because I, I apologize a lot and I thank a lot. And that's working out well um, with Lila on the whole, she's pretty good with her manners um, and her pleases and thank yous. Pretty good. For her yeah, I, I have to say at one point she said, sorry, Muffy, and then hit me again. Well, this is what I was going to say is that because what generally happens is like, okay, so I'm getting her undressed to get her in the bath and like the t the top that I'm pulling off over her head is a little bit too tight and it like clips her nose and I go, oh, sorry. And so it's like she now mimics that when she's a little bit hurt. She goes, oh, sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, 
what have I done to her? She's apologize. She's terrified of me. She's apologizing for now, me hurting her. This child is no shrinking violet. You're this right. child is just learning lines and like running amok. <laughs> but there is no when she says, "Oh, sorry," she's saying to herself. Far be it from me to do anything to discomfort you. You deserve to feel good all the time. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. That's yeah. all right then. It's good. It's yeah. good. But she just be careful when you're around her, not oh. to, uh, because she can hurt you. How's your head today? Uh, they're tender spots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Patches mm -hmm. of missing hair. But that, it's out of my eyes. It's out of your eyes. That's what Actually, some saying. of it got ripped out and went into my eyes. <laughs> no, it was just, <laughs> that's how she experiences us. Yeah. Hmm. There we go. We'll be right back with more Bewildered. I have a favor to ask. You might not know this, but ratings and reviews are like gold in the podcasting universe. They get podcasts in front of more faces, more eyes, more ears, all the bits that you could have a podcast in front of. That's what they do. So it would help us enormously if you would consider going over to your favorite podcasting app, especially if it's Apple. And giving us a few stars, maybe even five, maybe even six. If you can find a way to hack the system, I wouldn't complain. And uh, a review would be also be wonderful. We read them all and love them. So thank you very much in advance. Let's just go out there and bewilder the world. Mwah. All right, so let's move on to today's topic, which is today we're going to do a Be Wild Files episode. We are loving these. We've got mm -hmm. so many awesome questions from you all. Um, Be Wild Files for new listeners are, are the types of bewildered episodes where we talk about what you're trying to figure out because it's not all about us, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not all about us. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to figure out how to do this, and send your question, you go to rowanmangan.com slash bewildered and then you'll find out how to do it. And there's a very specific way to do it. Mm. Yeah. Um, but today we're talking to, well, we're not, we're, we're, yeah, we are, we're talking we're to listening. everyone, but we're listening. First we listen, then we talk Ooh, to. Good plan. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to Josephine. So let's hear Josephine's question. Okay. I'm trying to figure out why I have so much resistance towards doing things that are actually good for me and that bring me actual joy. Because my initial feeling towards those things is usually dread, I have to really force myself to do them and I wonder if it's really supposed to be that way. I always feel happier and lighter after having done them but Fighting with the resistance every day is tiring and I, it makes me feel unable to trust my instincts given that they're telling me not to do the things that are actually good for me. Do you have any advice on this? Thank you. What a brilliant question. Such a brilliant question. And we can totally relate to this. Oh my gosh. Like, today I have physical therapy, which is like my favorite thing. It has made me so much healthier and stronger. And when, as the time comes close to go to physical therapy, I will do everything I can to not go in there. Mm. I Driving along, I will consider turning and doing so many other things because part of me seems to be afraid of physical therapy. I seem loath to go to physical therapy, even though I love it and it makes me feel good. Same with writing, same with art projects, same with like parties. Like, no, don't make me. And then I go and it's good, you know? Yeah, I should have really thought about this more when I was in my phase of like pulling my pants down in front of my strangers because <laughs> um, I dreaded it but I think maybe at that time it might have been a good time to actually listen to my instincts you yeah know? yeah just you could get no pun work <laughs> yeah, I could. oh I could let me tell you um yeah, but writing is such a huge one for me with this yeah it's oh I don't want to I don't want to what I was saying to Marty it's like the you don't want to get in the bath, but you don't yes. want to get out of the bath. That I mean, that to me is like the classic sort of thing. And and anyway, but what does do the other people say? have that? We all have. Do we all have the don't want to get in the bath, don't want to get out of the bath? I believe it to be universal. Mm. I have don't want to go to sleep, don't want to get up. Mm, yeah, same, yeah. same principle, same principle. So what does the culture say about it? Well, I think the cultural message is like, this should not be an issue for you. Like, mm. you like it, you know it's good for you, just do it. Yeah. Why would you not? Are you crazy? And yet yeah. I think everybody has this ambivalence. 
And you know what? I mean, who knows what it is for Josephine? Like, I don't know. Mm. But um, I it did strike me listening to her question that the culture assumes when we are having to switch activities, mm-hmm. right, I have to start this new thing. It's really good for me. I know it is. But the culture says you are unitary, you are one thing, you are same all time. You come mm. out of factory, ready to go, batteries included, Robot. dum, 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 dum. And I don't think we are unitary in that way. Mm. And so I feel like maybe part of what I struggle with, you struggle with, Josephine struggles with is uh, and by the way, physical therapy is a terrible example because that's just objectively a horrible thing to do. It's with your wonderful. Life. But I hate it. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think maybe what we're all struggling with is that when you have to switch from one kind of self right, to right. another self, like so that that's really difficult, that there's an inertia yeah. uh, in us that wants to stay with what we're doing. Yeah. And and it's hard to go into a different state. It's hard to take off your clothes. Sorry for always talking about taking <laughs> off my clothes. And in the cold bathroom and get in the bath, even though you know you're going to be warm soon, it's still hard to take off your clothes. It is. It's very, very hard. And yeah. I want to say something about the word inertia. Sometimes people mistake it for inertness, like just laziness and lying there. But inertia literally means you go, a body when set in motion will continue in the same direction until acted on by an equal and opposite force. So it's the only thing I ever learned in physics. My friends and I, every (laughs) such idiots, but I have to just say this because some of them will be listening and they will remember this, is that whenever we would like pull up in a car and slam forward a bit, we'd go, God damn you inertia every time. Well, life is kind of like slamming up against the car dashboard over and over and over because we do have different parts. I've talked before about IFS, internal family systems therapy, which is this brilliant system. It works so well therapeutically. Also known as parts psychology. Yeah, there are different fields of parts psychology. And the, the whole idea is that every part of you, we've always known there are different parts of us, right? But that every part of you is a whole and complete personality that desert, not that you have dissociation, but like if you want to talk to the part of you that loves to cuddle in bed, it's literally a different person from the one who wants to jump out of bed and get going with the day. Drop your pants and get the oatmeal. Not in that order. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're, we're trying to switch from one part to another, like you say. And like, so for me, like I might be in admin, tick things off my list, do do achieving, achieving. And then I have to go into writing, which mm. is such a different um, persona and yeah. also has to like gets dopamine from really different things. Like mm. it's slow and it's, it's, nuanced and and subtle and admin is like and it's done the bill is paid and admin chick is like look at all the dopamine i'm making over here why would you want to go there yeah yeah yeah. and so anyway i mean that have so i have like yeah the the writer kind of part and i have admin chick um then i have this other part and i mean you're right they're so distinct so distinct because we talk about my hestia self like my goddess of the hearth self like which i haven't been inhabiting very much lately it's interesting like i um but it's like the part of me that uh cooks hearty lovely food for my family and and is very like and likes to clean up and create and buys flowers and puts them on the table and the funny thing is when she's up yeah you talk like she's always up oh I know (laughs) oh they're like oh I love it like I had a um I had a a client once who a famous famous person who I, I had lunch with her and then the next week she was like, remember the times we used to have? And I was like, you mean lunch? But she'd extended it into this long relationship. And you do the same with Hestia. Oh, I just love all the cooking we've done here. And <laughs> I'm, this is a cruel thing to say, but you had to have certain items of cookware when we moved here. That's years ago. Normal. That you have literally never used. How dare you? I've used them twice. No, the tagine. Oh, the tagine was purely decorative, and I must say it's a lovely piece of our studio. Oh, that's right. Now it's part of the studio. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the tagine hasn't got a lot of So podcast chick came out and said, 
up yours, Hestia. I'm taking the tajine. It's so true. It's so true. Could, you're literally stealing from each other. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 What are your parts? Tell me about oh, your oh, Just for example, like I know there's loads, but just The writer self thing. is like this manic, focused, gum-chewing, like uh, disciplined. Uh, and then there's. Can I say something really interesting? What? I don't know if you're going to like me saying this, oh. um, but when Marty was writing her last book, she she's like a, she's a very weird person, you guys. I don't know if it's you've true. picked this up yet. True. One of the things she likes to do is un- know her pH levels of her body <laughs> and she's always trying to get more alkaline, more alkaline, more alkaline. I won't talk about how she gets the readings. It's not relevant. But when she was writing her last book, she um, – you would like when you would write and you were always complaining and grumpy about it oh, and you struggling it. through and you would go into your little room and get your little reading of and you would be more alkaline than any dietary or anything. Well, once I'm in it, once I'm in it, it's like swimming through a deep ocean and I don't even need to breathe. It's like But ooh. your body yeah, my body loved it too. Yeah. That's what that's what Josephine was saying. These are good things. These are yeah. nature, but they're human nature. So it kind of goes beyond just what an animal would do. There are things that we can do that are like deeply engross us that an animal could not do. So it's nature, but human. But then there is, I'm writing this book right now about anxiety and how like the opposite of is creativity in some ways. So I thought I got to walk my talk. I'm going to do all the instructions that I give in the book for enhancing your creative side. So I used to draw and paint all the time when I was a kid. I was like, oh, I haven't done it for years. And I got, I thought, I'm just going to do this to see if it works. Guys, I, sorry, folks. I have to say she's being very modest here. She's a very accomplished painter and artist. It's not like she last picked up a Crayola when she was nine. She's, you know. She's- well, when I, it's a, it was a really good nature culture thing because the reason I kind of slowed down and stopped is like, oh, do we need a painting for the wall? Oh, could I sell that? Oh, that could be the cover of a book. I was always using it for something. But mm. this was just, I'm going to open up my creative side and the, what I draw or paint doesn't even matter. I just keep stacking them up. But it's been a very weird month. <laughs> yeah, because I'll say. <laughs> artist self is not going to stop. Yeah. Like it it was like letting a bear out of a cage. She, I've been getting up at four in the morning and painting like 12 hours a day whenever I get a chance. I like, it's, I went to a therapist to talk about it. It's really been severe. And it's because artist part was starved for art. Mm. But, and she don't like to change states. Oh no, she mm. doesn't. And then, but then somebody will, like call for a session or whatever. I'll go online and do a group call and I'm completely obsessed with the other person. All I want to do is understand their psychology. And then artist self doesn't even know their name. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's quite disconcerting in some ways. It's really fascinating. It's really fascinating because it feels like to me, like, um, that there's just something in our programming. I don't think it's wrong or right, but there's just a quirk in our programming that says, well, like in inertia, it's our physics, right? Mm. That whatever state we're in, mm-hmm. we prefer to stay in it. And that seems kind of natural to me. Like, um, you know, like the the thing of, with toddlers, like it's everything, everything is parenting when you've got a toddler. Yeah. Uh, or when you are a toddler, which I am at heart. Your artist self, really. <laughs> oh, my God. Lila had to say to me the other day, because I'm doing watercolor, and the best part of your body to judge how how moist the brush is, which is really important, is to touch it to your lips. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting there painting, and my two-year-old came up and said, oh, Muffy, don't eat your paint. <laughs> like, I like it. Go away. <laughs> anyway, yes, I am a toddler, and it's all toddlers. And they have tantrums at transition times. Yeah, like it's any parent of a toddler will tell you that you, you get them in a thing and, and that so much of managing your toddler's insanity, I'm just going to say it, <laughs> is preparing them for transitions, managing how to make it as easy as possible to go through transitions. And it's interesting because, like, like, why do you think that is? Well, I... I actually think um, it's an uh, adaptation that makes us able to learn intensely, like more than other species. And we have this mutation called neoteny that is present in other animals only when they're babies. Hmm. And they learn very, very rapidly, and then they just stop. We have that, and a mutation in our 
genes never turns it off. So we're curious like toddlers our whole lives. Mm. And speaking of curiosity, I was, you have this genius way, which I think is transferable to adults of getting Lila out of a tantrum, a transition tantrum. So she, and she is a very dramatic child as well as very powerful. So she throws her mighty <laughs> power against the floor and ah! And Ro just quietly picks up a book and starts reading aloud to herself about, oh, I don't know, the Gruffalo. Or Hi, Bernie. I'm Larry, and this is my book. Mm, yeah. And just softly reading. Um, and Lila's, ah, and checking to see how you're responding. And then she's finally like, oh, the curiosity pulls her into the state of wanting to be reading books. I need to say that it's not... These aren't full-on tantrums. These are more like protests because oh, yeah. when she's in a full-on tantrum, it, I could be I could be reading, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. Like if she's lost in it, she's lost in it. But so the the, the yeah. analogy only goes so far. Yes, there are tantrums and then there is drama. Yes, it helps a lot with <laughs> drama and, you know, with our own drama too potentially. It's so interesting because I have a friend who is not a two-and-a-half-year-old. They're in their 60s now, I think, and – used to want to be invited to things and I would invite them to things and they would not come at the very last moment they would cancel very very reluctant to actually travel to something always asking to be invited but never coming mm -hmm. and finally I just got frustrated and started saying um you're not really invited but here are the things we're going to do <laughs> and they'd be like oh yeah I can't come but what you're going to be oh really you're going to like track bears okay um all right. And then they would say no. And then they would show up. <laughs> it was exactly the same thing. Triggering curiosity actually is a way of appealing to human nature. It's a powerful force. Maybe curiosity is the force that is powerful enough to switch the inertia of a state. Oh, that's interesting. So if I I have to write a novel, I'm right at the beginning of it. It's not, you know, I'm not really getting paid it yet. So mm -hmm. how can I like trigger my curiosity about it. I'm trying to think how do I apply that, the, the curiosity or the play. Oh, you have to make you have to have an unanswered question. You have to have something go on in the very first page that's like, what? Right? Yeah. Like the, the, the protagonist makes some oatmeal, drops your pants for the babysitter, and you, you never explain why. I'm starting to think actually on that that it might have been deliberate by Lila just as a as a stunt she might have just been like hey look at this <laughs> now that you mention it it sounds very much like her it does doesn't it oh. all right well let's let's come back to this let's try to figure out how we come to our senses on this topic right after this so here we are again talking about how to switch states to doing things that are good for you and you like but you don't want to do them at first yeah and it was so interesting because we always say okay what's the cultural story then what's, what does nature do? And it's like, what would a lion do? What would mm -hmm. a tree do? Mm -hmm. And this was different. Yeah. It was different. And we realized that there is a nature to us that it, is, it really is genuinely unique. Yeah. And Marty used this phrase, maybe you've heard it before, human nature. And I was like, <clears throat> oh, my God, human nature. Right. And that is exactly where this falls because... It's not, a lion won't behave this way. No. A tree won't behave this way. Hard to imagine, I know. <laughs> um, mind a you, tree trees are like, terrible at changing state. <laughs> no, they're not. They're like winter, cold. Ooh, I'm getting undressed. No problem. Drop their leaves. No, they complain about it. Oh, well. And they're slow. <laughs> only in, in our time frame. Anyway, um, the reason I would say this is human nature, I, it, it, we don't want to give the out of saying, well, of course my mother did this or that. It's her human nature. No, no, no. To be human nature in my book, it has to be something that's true across cultures. Mm. So it has to be any human would pretty much do this okay. if, with a working set of human psychology. So one of the things that I think <laughs> is universally true for all cultures is this reluctance to change states, having to be... It's a big claim that everyone... Like. Yeah, and and the other thing is the, the cultural response is usually just do it, like do what I say, do what the culture says. And I do believe it's universally true that when you shove 
someone into something, they start to shove back. We don't like to be controlled or pushed. Oh, and that it's, like is universal. The, it's like the instinct to, you know, like to pull back. Like if someone, there's a, there's some word for this. It's like an evolutionary thing. Hmm. Um, if you're, you know, like uh, tug of war, like yeah. if, if, like what a dog does, the dog has the same thing. When right. you fight with a dog, oh. if you pull, they pull back. That's and that's, so that's a, like some sort of. I don't know. It's yeah. an instinct, and it, it's. I feel like it's the same thing. It's like if you push me, I'm going to yeah. dig in my heels. Yeah, um, it's a terrible, sad example, but it's in, it's still interesting to look at the wild boy, the wild child of Avignon. Oh yeah, yeah. He was this poor kid who was probably literally raised by wolves. Like something fed him for a few years, but he was cognitively really impaired from growing up in the woods, and probably like eating rocks or whatever. But so, a psychologist adopted him. And he didn't know language. He had never been socialized. But when they tried to force him to do something that he that wasn't at its usual time when he was used to it, he would fight like crazy. Like that resistance to being shoved was really wide awake in him, even though he had very little socialization. Mm. And I just, everywhere I've been in the world, I've seen the same dynamic. So I think it's human nature. Yeah, and you know we we need only look to the toddler community, <laughs> the to toddler see, community. To see how true this is. We really want to reach out in this podcast to the toddler community, <laughs> our friends in the toddler community. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Got it out of your eyes. Um, but the point, the takeaway from that is, if you want to switch states in accordance with your nature, don't be mean or pushy with yourself. It does not work. Yeah, don't do it. Don't. Think about self-kindness as oh, softy, softy, la, la, pathetic. No, it doesn't work. Yeah. It's ineffective. Just yeah. be nice to yourself because it's more effective. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I'll do anything you say. It's like, honey, we're going to do this. And I understand you don't want to. It's that kind of position that you take vis-a-vis -vis yourself. And I think you have to prepare yourself. This is actually good uh, psychological research on change, that there has to be a contemplation and a preparation phase before people actively go into a different, into a transition. So you need to be prepared psychologically a little bit ahead of time. So now we're applying, applying this to ourselves. Like I have to go write on my novel for an hour yeah. and I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I have to, so, so I have to prepare in five minutes. It's time to turn off the television, Lila, and then we're going right. to be going upstairs and you're going to be getting in the bath. I like to give myself a little reward before I do something. People want it to re be reserved to, to after. No, no kidding. I'm like, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to paint <laughs> for 12 hours and then I'm going to do something else for five minutes. Um, no, really, I have to say, look, I will let myself like listen to an audio book for five minutes, lie down and listen to an audio book. And then I'll be ready to switch into a coach mode and go on zoom and do things and whatever. And if I just go, if, if you come in and say, Marty, have you checked your calendar? And I have to switch right away. It is murder. Yeah, I know. Cause you're the one I murder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You are not pleasant at these times, but actually it's called action priming. It, you psychologically prime the transition, like, okay, we're going to, yes, five more minutes of this or an hour of that or, yeah, two weeks vacation and then it's back to the grindstone at the no pun bar. I like to reward myself before, during and after. I find that that's the <laughs> maximal way to reward myself. Actually, you know, that's not far wrong because, okay, here's the thing. There's an underlying thing in Josephine's question that we've already pretty much dispensed with, which is we only do things that are rewarding. Like there are very few things that we try to do that are not intrinsically rewarding and good for us. Like we all the, specifically or we generally? The two of us, oh, and, us and Karen and basically everybody in our house, except Lila. She's got a job to do and it's mm. brutal. Um, no, but uh, so you are, you prime your action before. And you give something, yourself something enjoyable. Then when you switch in, if it's good for you and you like it, it is enjoyable when you're there. Yeah. And then afterward, it feels good and you give yourself a reward. So it is before, during, and after. So what we need to look at then, it seems to me, is just how to ease that period before. Because mm -hmm. Josephine's ac accepted, you know, I feel so good. And I think she even means during to yeah. an extent and after yeah. as well. It's the starting. So we've just got to, so we're going to um, 
tell it, tell that part ahead yeah. of time, the part that you're in at the moment. Right. Okay, we're going to be doing some writing soon. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Um, okay. Be respectful of it. You know, um, it reminds me of Frodo in Lord of the Rings trying to get the ring to throw it into the crevasse at Mordor. And he's gone through like 8,000 pages of adventures and he can't do it. He gets closer and closer. The ring is heavier and heavier. And when he's supposed to, uh, spoiler alert, when he's supposed to throw the ring into the crevasse, he puts it on his finger instead. He just can't let it go. And then something else happens that I won't spoil, but the ring goes into the crevasse, people. Anyway, it's brutal and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse as he goes. And I think what we need to do is know that it's going to get, the inertia is going to push back harder and harder. So we need a transitional activity. You, you were saying this, a transitional activity that's fun, that leads us toward the new thing. Right. But I don't know what that would be. I just think it sounds like a good idea. No, you do this. Remember what? your fun machines? Oh, okay. So that's, but that's not transitional. That's, I guess that's like me tempting myself towards the thing. It's a way to reward myself before, during, after, right, during and right. after. Um, so one of the things I used to do is there, I don't know if it still exists, but there used to be an app that you could write in that made your key, keyboard sound all clacky, like a typewriter. <laughs> and it really makes you want to write because you're like, um, yeah, so I, you know, I actually wrote about this a while ago in my in my Wild Adventures Substack. I wrote a thing about morning self and how I trick my morning self into writing by setting things up the night before and like putting the coffee right, on right. so it's right there. And there's a lovely big chair, and I make sure the chair's all clear. See, and the hestia part of you is doing that. Yeah. Mm, so she oh, comes up and they does can that. help each other. We cannot, we're a community that is suddenly mm. now helping each other do things instead of in opposition. Yeah, that's I want to cool. do this, you want to do that. No, I'll do this for you, I'll make that more fun, and then you'll do that for me, it'll make things more fun. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like it's so easy to think of ways to punish yourself for not oh, yeah. doing it. Like I, when I said that thing about a writing app, another one came into my head which used to have a thing where you would be writing and if you stopped for too long, it would start deleting what you'd already <gasps> written. And I'm oh like, my that's, God. that's what we think we have to do to make ourselves do things. Oh, my God. But what we actually have to do is make it go clickety, clackety, clickety, clickety. I know. I wrote a book once about, like, being healthy and fit and whatnot and um, don't ever read it. And I talked about how to reward yourself. And I even mentioned that in experiments with animals, Reward as a reinforcement for behavior is 51 times more powerful than punishment. So you need 51 sticks for every carrot. Just use carrots, right? So I was like, set up rewards for yourself. And I had so many people after that book came out and said, I have trouble coming up with rewards and punishments that work well enough. And I'm like, there's no punishment in that. There's no, no, it's stupid. Don't use it. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But culturally, we are very dedicated to punishment when we don't do what we're, we think we're supposed to do, it doesn't work. It's counterproductive. I, it reminds me, when I was writing that book, I wrote a whole chapter about a pig learning to push a shopping cart without ever even having it demonstrated. And the, the trainers just would, they put a pig in a room with a shopping cart. And then at first, just when it came close to the shopping cart, they would throw it like a kibble. And it started hanging out around the shopping cart. Then they, it had to touch the shopping cart before it got kibble, then put one leg up. And I, after a couple of weeks, it was just strutting around the room, pushing the sharp shopping cart and collecting do you know kibble. About, do you know about clicker training? I, I have heard them click. Yeah, so it's you use it. You probably use it with a pig. I, I'd be surprised if they didn't actually, because it's such a good way of doing that. Is that you click at the moment they do the right thing, because Ooh. you can't make the food happen at the exact second, oh. but you have a little clicker, and the second like they use it with horses a lot as well. Oh. They can really understand it, and they get the reward really quickly after. I want the clicker. A clicker. I know. I, I actually had one. Could had we? One. Could we like do clicker training on each other? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, the clicker itself is a reward. Uh, Anything that clicks, like the clickety, clickety, clack. I think clicking, there's a reason that's a a word we talk about. That just clicks for me. I think clicking Mm. is the answer. I think we've, I think we finally figured it out. Wow. I'm going to take that to physical therapy later because. um, Actually, you know what else is the same? Playing pool, playing snooker. 
the the sound that the balls make as they click together is inherently rewarding. It is, but I can't make it happen right. And that makes me want to kill myself with a broken pool cue. Mm. But happen right. If you can just make them click, if that's your goal, uh, the clicking. Don't worry no, about the holes. Don't worry about the little holes. Uh, anyway, this is getting very complicated because if you just had a clicker, that would be fine. But if you're setting up a billiard table in my office where I'm writing so that you can make a click every time I write something good, that's just a lot of work. And we're going to have to incentivize ourselves to get into that mode really hard. It's starting to sound like the Google offices, like the snooker right. boards everywhere. Limber up, bro. Take your pool cue. I'm going to write now. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I love it. And I also think that, you know, we can use each other and other people to, yes. to do this. I, one of the things I try to do with writing is um, there's like a writer's community that I'm a part of and they, they do this thing that's from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. every day, my time zone. And I just turn up for that. I log on to Zoom. Everyone's muted out. You have a little chat at the beginning. Hi. And then clickety, clackety, clickety, clackety, clickety, clackety, clack for an hour. And every now and again, like, honestly, I, I just open it up and just look at their little faces. Everyone's still working. <laughs> yeah, still working. All right. Me too, I guess. That's really good uh, human nature usage because we are – social primates and social primates do things together. And even, even those of us who are introverted and answer, not anthropomorphic <laughs> and not androgynous, misanthropic, misanthropic. <laughs> yeah. Even us, we like doing things when there's a group of people doing it. Yeah. It feels easier somehow. It does. So yeah, somewhere between that and exotic animal training, I, I, I hire Pay money. Pay somebody money to oh, show up yeah. and make you do it. Oh, yeah. I go, I'm going to go in later today and, and the goddess of physical therapy is going to make me do things that you have never imagined. No one has ever imagined the things that this woman makes me do. It's, wow. Yeah. I think we're going to have to have a conversation. Yeah. I mean it like it sounds. I don't know how she thinks this up. Like you... How can you do nine different things to my body that I've never done before? And she can isolate <laughs> the one muscle I've never used in my life. The one. And oh I have God. to adopt the weirdest positions to get this to happen. And I'm just like, I, oh, Bridget, I love this. How I hate you. It's very, very conflicted. Um, she's a goddess. I can't. So deny listeners, it. if your partner suddenly starts talking about physical therapy. <laughs> You might want to have a discussion about BDSM dominatrixes, dominatrices. Dominatrices. <laughs> and nerd sex. <laughs> Could I have two dominatrices, please? <laughs> well, it sounds actually... like you're doing just fine with one. Uh, well, some yeah, of us so... do too. Yeah, that's okay. I'm, I'm a little worried about that. But as far as Josephine goes, I really think that and and for all of us as well, if we have this issue, it's not your issue, that's a whole different thing. It's a whole different show. Um, transitions, moving into things that are good for us and we enjoy, if that's hard for you. It's such a great first world <laughs> problem, isn't it? Um, then like actually using creativity to make the transition yes. itself fun, like focus on that transition moment yeah. instead of now I'm in this state, I will be in this state. Right. How do we bridge the two states? And being respectful and loving toward the part that doesn't want to stop instead of yeah. saying, you have to stop now. Yeah. It's like, oh, I so get that you love to paint or that you love to um, cook with a tagine or whatever it is. <laughs> but I get it. I totally get it. You're going to get to do it later. Um, and now we're going to do something else fun. Look, mm -hmm. click. <laughs> click and click. I used to go when I was writing that book about the shopping cart pig, I thought this is a great idea. And I was I gave myself two weeks to write this book before the deadline. Of course you did. I had other things going on. And so I wrote like 20 hours a day and I'd be writing at three in the morning and my eyes would be all blurry. I'd put the type set up to 90,000 pixels. And then if I finished like a section, I would go to the all night pharmacy and I would buy myself something really shiny. <laughs> Pens that lit up. Little glitter bows to put in my hair or whatever. And I found that appealing to that part of our nature that likes sparkly objects mm -hmm. weirdly worked. I also sent myself um, cards congratulating myself. And here's how weird it was. When I got them, they made me so happy. <laughs> 
So you how can't did you, trick yourself. How did your physical therapist feel about this? I don't know. Did I'm you? Not... You didn't get punished at all for it, did you? Well, <laughs> depends on what you call punishment. I'll just say this: she handed me a cup of coffee and a bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> it's just human nature. <gasps> All right. So if that hasn't sorted out all your confusion, we have to change states now. We don't. stop podcasting. I don't want to. I don't either. We're we just going to have to keep them here forever. Yeah. Mm. This, this is the podcast that never ends. Oh, we'll let you guys go, though. You folks, we'll let you folks go we'll. and find a shiny object and a lovely transitional trick to get you to your next happy thing. And stay, stay wild. wild. We hope you're enjoying Bewildered. If you're in the USA and want to be notified when a new episode comes out, text the word WILD to 570-873-0144. We're also on Instagram. Our handle is Bewildered Podcast. You can follow us to get updates, hear funny snippets and outtakes, and chat with other fans of the show. Bewildered is produced by Scott Forster with support from the brilliant team at MBI. And remember, if you're having fun, please rate and review and stay wild.